three British mountaineers attempt the climb of their lives in Alaska. But within sight of the summit, the weather stops them in their tracks. Stay! When frostbite threatens the life of one climber, the others must decide. Stay together and hope for a rescue that may never come, or leave their friend behind. If we leave Nigel here, he dies. One man risks his life to go for help alone. But tragedy strikes. He faces almost certain death, knowing his friends have little hope of rescue. I've let them down. I've let my mates down, and uh, they're probably going to die. Mount McKinley is the highest mountain in North America. It stands in the Arctic Circle. It's one of the toughest climbs in the world. The team has set their sights on the 20,000-foot peak. They've been climbing for an energy-sapping two and a half weeks and should be one day from the summit. Steve Bull has been climbing for 18 years and has conquered some of the highest peaks in the world. For me, the um, mountain environment is a very special and beautiful place. Particularly Mount McKinley, it's um, one of the great wildernesses of this world. It's been one of my ambitions for a long time. Anthony Hollinshead is Steve's best friend and his long-time climbing partner. Climbing is predominantly having trust in your, in your climbing partner. It's paramount that you know what the other's doing. Nigel Vardy completes the three-man team. This is his first expedition with the others. He's an experienced climber, but he's never attempted a mountain as treacherous as Mount McKinley. I sometimes suffer a little bit with confidence, and sometimes I have to say, Nigel, you can do this, you'll be fine. Originally, Steve had the dream of climbing McKinley. And really, we perhaps followed his lead. It would be the first big expedition that Nigel had done, so I think he was a little unsure of what was in front of him. With Nigel coming into the team, it's obviously changes the team dynamics slightly, I suppose. Stephen and I were used to making decisions. Nigel, you ready? There's an awful lot of pressure to work together well because you are reliant on each other, absolutely reliant. There is nobody else there. Come on, let's get going. There are a number of routes up Mount McKinley. One of the most popular is the West Buttress. But Steve, Anthony and Nigel have decided to tackle the much tougher West Rib route. After 17 days of severe climbing, they've reached their last camp at 16,000 feet. They aim to go for the summit tomorrow. The night before the summit, but we're in the tent. We're all pretty high. I think we're ready for it tomorrow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, dehydrated meat or fish, or how about our lovely powdered vegetarian option? He is a real comedy character to know, is Anthony. Full of life, always got a good laugh. Hey, nice bit of colour you picked up today. You'll be in swimming trunks tomorrow. Did you not put your sunblock on today? Steve's quite the opposite. Steve's a very serious character. Should be like a religion to you, Nigel. No other sun can do to your skin up here. Right. Fast up, fast down, OK? So let's strip all the unnecessary gear and pack a kit. What we agreed. Frillies in tutus. <laughs> <laughs> the conditions can be extremely hostile at this altitude. The team must be sure of the weather before they decide on making the challenging climb for the summit. Mr. Jensen, 
Weather's looking fairly good for the next 24 hours. Copy that base. Good night. Good enough? <sighs> we better get some beauty sleep then, eh? <laughs> to infinity and beyond. Fellas, you should have had this done earlier. He said, run for the summit, stick the flag on, get the photographs, and back down again. To get to the summit and back before nightfall, they need to travel light. They leave the tent and most of their equipment behind. The climb to the summit is about 4,000 feet from here, maybe a little bit more, and it's a lot to do in this altitude. So we've got to go light and get back down before it goes dark. They now face one of the toughest sections of the climb. Steve was sort of, come on, let's get on this thing. Bang, 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 and away he went. On the opening stages, um, I'm not doing bad at all. But as the day is progressing, I'm thinking that we're moving pretty slow and we need to keep it moving a bit faster. It takes us such a long time to cover this, the time is really ticking away. After hours of hard climbing, the team are already behind schedule. They've now reached an area known as the football field, a flat plateau just below the summit but the weather is changing. As we walked across the top of the football field, the wind started to increase rapidly. The temperatures dropped to around minus 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, with the wind howling over the summit ridge at about 70 miles an hour, I don't know what that takes you down to but um, it's cold, believe me. <laughs> Every step is, is just draining. You're almost crawling, really, just to sort of get your face out of the wind. It can be like being hit with hailstones, frozen peas, if you've got exposed flesh. Weather conditions on Mount McKinley are some of the most unpredictable in the world and can cause death by flash freezing in seconds. We'd all got 17 days hard climbing behind us, which means you don't carry a lot of excess fat, which is what you need in a situation like this. These conditions are very tough for all of them, but for one, the conditions are proving too much. What I didn't realise was how cold Steve was getting. Steve was getting bitterly cold. I can feel myself going down. I'm shivering, my teeth are chattering, my thought process is slowing down, I'm becoming lethargic. Steve, who is leading the team, is beginning to feel the effects of hypothermia. He's literally freezing to death. They're at over 19,000 feet and the temperature is plummeting. At such altitudes, the impact of an unpredicted storm like this is devastating. Steve is suffering badly. Anthony and Nigel know that they have to get him out of the freezing cold. We need to look for shelter. Get somewhere safe, now! Finding anywhere to hide up there is very difficult. You really are out on your own. Wait! Up there! By the grace of God, we found a crevasse at the base of the summit cone. We took our ice axes and opened the face of it up, which was very hard work. I can feel myself going down. I'm shivering. Hypothermia is it, going to come soon if I don't get out of this wind. Easy! Easy! 
was a wind that was killing us. And once we were in there, I'm not going to say it was warm, but it was warmer. Ah, oh, look! Look up! Please! 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 As the cold's taking effect, your mind's slowing down, your reactions are slowing down, thought process is slowing down. So um, I'm relying then on others to take care of me. Jesus! I need you to hug me! I need you to get some warmth into me! Steve asks me to uh, sort of cuddle him, uh, keep, keep him warm, really. Have you ever tell anyone about this at Climbing Club? And your toes. Anthony was talking to Steve quite a lot, and I think that probably came from the fact that they were great friends anyway. They'd known each other a long, long time, and Anthony just wasn't going to let him go. Ah, ah, thirsty! Thirsty! Ah, ah, give us a drink! Ah, ah, nice drink! Let's see what we've got here. Dehydration is a major, major problem. The team begin to regret leaving their equipment behind. What's that then, Nudge? We should have carried a stove to reheat and to get some warm food inside us and, and possibly a, a better drink inside us. Send help. We'll never get Steve down on our own, not in the state that he's in. We've got no choice. Oh, he's still shivering and moving. That's a really good sign. Nigel and Anthony know that Steve would want to carry on, but they now must decide if they should call off the climb and send out a mayday call. It's a very difficult decision to actually decide that we, we've got to make this mayday call because we don't know how Steve's going to react. We need to call now rather than wait until it's too late. Just hope there's enough charge in the battery to get through. Try to keep it warm, but it's so cold. Is it okay? We'll get a better signal outside. Base camp. This is Expedition Denson. Do you copy? This is Expedition Denson requesting urgent assistance. Over. This is Base Camp. Base Camp receiving. If you're trying to reach us, we can hear your button being pressed, but no voice transmission. Repeat, your button, but not your voice. I felt very happy to hear somebody else's voice. That there was somebody there. But they were really struggling to hear us. We need you to respond by click. One click for yes, two for no. And so they started off, are you this expedition? One click for yes, two clicks for no. Are you Expedition Zambezi? We just went down until they got a click for yes. Are you Expedition Denson? And at that point, they've got who you are, what route you're climbing, next of kin, equipment, all this information they can use. The storm is too bad to rescue you tonight. We need you to call again in the morning. What did they say? I'm to call. We reconfirm our position in the morning. We've just got to get through tonight. Radio again tomorrow. Steve? No, Steve, stop moving. Steve! Steve! Steve is becoming dangerously hypothermic, and now Nigel is also losing his battle against the cold. I don't realise I'm going hypothermic, and my own mind is shutting down. 
Antony must try to keep his two friends alive in temperatures of minus 30 degrees at almost 20,000 feet. It's been a long night, but eventually Antony emerges to see if the weather at least may be changing for the better. With daybreak comes another surprise. Morning. You just seem disgustingly fit for a man who was a shivering wreck last night. Obviously these big manly arms are mine. <laughs> Stuffed. Overnight, Antony managed to slow the process of hypothermia by holding Steve's body close to his own providing much-needed insulation against the cold. It was a vast improvement from the previous night. Steve actually was in a good condition. Come on, let's go and check where we are. What about Nige? Oh, we can get him later. Look, just like you and I, let's go and have a look at this mountain that we've been talking about for so long. OK. At this point, I'm still hoping to make it to the summit for all three of us to get there. <laughs> Will you look at that? It's there for the taking. Come on, let's go for it. Steve. Last night, you were pretty bad, you know. Nigel thought, we both thought that... he should radio a distress call. What the hell did you do that for? And what did they say? Nigel went outside to make the call. He said the radio didn't seem to be working. One last push and we're there. So let's get back, radio base, and tell them that we're all fine now. Look, I'm sorry, mate, but you were a real mess. It's fine. Really. Let's just get back, get Nigel, radio in and push on. <sighs> Nigel still needs to radio in to confirm their position and let base camp know that their emergency is over. I took the radio and I put it on the edge of the crevasse top while I hold myself up and my rucksack. And I knocked it with my elbow. And just watched this little black dot go flying down the slope. And I thought, you prat. Base camp, this is Expedition Denson. Do you copy? It's dead. Which was a hell of a thing to realise. Base camp, this is Expedition Denson. Please come in. Your only means of contact with the outside world was gone. And it's the one thing that could save you, is being able to talk to people. Nigel! Has everything OK? Guys! So sorry. I've dropped the radio. I've broken it. Nice. Your face. I'd missed this completely. I'd not realised it was happening. And he looked at me and I could feel his hand come up and pull. I've got balaclavas here and just pulls them over. And I can't feel this cold. I can feel numbness, but I can't feel any further. Look at Nigel, and I'm shocked. He's in a terrible state. Uh, the day before, he got sunburnt on his cheek, and overnight frost must have got into into this because his face was swollen up the size of a football. I don't know how long he's going to last. We've just got to get him off. Let's get you inside, eh? Look, Steve, 
so sorry. Maybe the two of you can push on. I know how important getting to the top is for the both of you. Look, let's not worry about that now, okay? Steve and Anthony took it fantastically well, actually, and I felt immensely guilty. Still do. We've got to get down. Get him to a hospital and quickly. The mountain will be here next year, be here the year after. If we leave Nigel like this, he might not be. We've got to get down. With the radio now broken, all chance of communication is gone. It's a race against time for Steve and Anthony to get Nigel down the mountain. As soon as they start their descent, the team realize that Nigel is suffering from more than just frostbite. When we set off back, it's, it's, it's obvious that Nigel is struggling, and we didn't realize that his eyesight was quite as bad as it was. The swelling on Nigel's face has forced his eyes shut. He's becoming weaker and confused, slower with every step. It's a feeling of being out of control. He was falling over and tripping over. It, 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 was, it was painful to see. Steve was starting to cool down as again, uh, and that was becoming a concern for Steve. I am worried about both Steve and Nigel at this stage. Go on, fellas! Keep the pace! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! The temperature has now dropped to around minus 30 degrees. Nigel is slowing the team down, and Steve knows that it won't be long before he again succumbs to the cold. We've got to get down. We've got to get somebody down now and organize a rescue. Tony. I can't keep going at this slow pace. I'm gonna go hypothermic again. I'm gonna have to go down on my own. The decision when Steve says this to me is, is do I stay with Nigel or do I go with Steve? If we leave Nigel here, he dies. I didn't think Nigel was in a fit condition to sit it out on his own, I don't think he would have uh, lasted very long if, he, if he'd been left to his, his own devices. You're the only one who can make that descent on their own. It's up to you, mate. Are you sure? Very selfless of him to stay with Nigel. You be all right. Will you? I'll see you later. Steve. What's your step? Somewhere in the back of my mind, I can hear some mumbling going on. And Steve walks away. And I'm looking at him, squinting, thinking, Steve, where are you going? And he's gone. Set ourselves here for a while, okay? Yeah. I'm trying to keep it from the forefront of my mind, but it's obvious that there is a chance that Nigel could die. It's a weird experience seeing Steve go off on his own. 
It's a massive responsibility for me to get down and I feel the weight of that responsibility. It's on my shoulders to make sure that these pair live. Steve believes the lives of his friends now depend on him, successfully making the treacherous descent down the mountain alone to raise the alarm. He's decided to descend by the more popular west buttress route, where he hopes he's more likely to meet other climbers. But it's not the route the team used for their ascent, so Steve has no experience of it. The pressure's on to get them down really fast now, but I can't pick out where the route's going. I'm worried at this moment that I'm not gonna be able to get down quick enough for Nigel. I know that sometime Anthony will make a decision that he's gotta get down if no one's come up to rescue him. And I'm worried that if he leaves that decision too long, he too is going to, is going to die up there. I need to get down as fast as I can. Steve knows he has to find the most direct way down, no matter what the risks. I'm going to go for the ice chute. I think it's the fastest option, and I can clearly see where I'm going. Down climbing is much harder than up climbing, and when you've not got a rope on or someone to care for you up above, the risk's high. My heart's pounding a little bit. Everything seems firm, everything's holding. Okay, big breath, come on, let's go. All of a sudden, there's a crack. And I'm off. The adrenaline's going, and I'm, I'm thinking so fast that these seconds I'm falling feels like minutes. There's absolutely no way I can plant this ice axe to stop my fall. It would just rip my arm out of the socket. I need to stop. Steve has fallen around 1,100 feet. Oh, I can't believe I'm still alive. The fall should have killed me. Steve has severely injured both his legs. The right is fractured, but his left is shattered in 12 places. He's over 17,000 feet up, and in his condition, a huge distance from the route where he had hoped to find help. Over 2,000 feet above him, his friends are waiting for the rescue that may now never come. We still can't eat or drink anything, and this is almost 36 hours after we'd set off. Uh, so, you know, it's a long time to go without taking anything on board. There is little uh, we can do to stay warm without using our energies up. Not knowing quite what the next step is going to be. And we're telling kiddies jokes, <laughs> which aren't very funny. How do you keep a dog from smelling? <laughs> Hold his nose. <laughs> Listen. 
Listen. Oh. Steve's got down and given him our position. We're gonna be okay. You're listening and listening and listening and thinking to yourself, fantastic. This could be it. Help! Help! I can hear helicopters. I can hear the chopper blades coming round and round the mountain. thinking to myself, are oh, they looking for us? There's a rescue party coming up the mountain now, are we going to be safe? And the blades go away and sink into the distance. At this kind of altitude, a helicopter rescue is virtually impossible. Whatever they can hear, it's unlikely that it's deliverance. <laughs> Beneath them, Steve is critically injured, but is making a heroic effort to drag himself to where he can be spotted by other climbers. His injuries are so bad, he might not live, but Steve believes that if he fails, all three of them will die on the mountain. I've got to gain access to the popular route where people will be coming up. But my only hope is going back up the ice chute I've just fallen down. I've still got the cramp on on my right leg and I'm using that right leg to purchase me up. I can feel the bone grating as I'm going. <laughs> I get so far up and my crampon slips and I'm sliding back down again. On the way down, I bang my left leg. Pain's quite excruciating now. I need to take a look at my legs and see what condition they're in. I roll up my trousers. The bone on my left leg is sticking through the skin. I'm really concerned now that I might bleed to death. And try to put pressure on, on the wound to stem the flow. I'm pressing down onto bone end and, and just raw fibres showing through the skin. To have somebody there with you is fantastic. He's being like a nursemaid and being a very, very good one. Frostbite has started to affect Nigel's hands and feet. They're deteriorating fast. Nigel's extremely weak. He's very cold. Uh, and myself, I, I'm actually getting colder at this stage. Let's get this glove back on. As time ticks on now, I am becoming a bit disconcerted about 
being out another night um, with Nigel uh, in, in a very weak condition. Come on now. Won't be long. Could be on the way any minute. <laughs> Steve is desperate to press on for help. He must splint his leg to keep going. I tie my ice axe uh, around my leg to try and support it. Everything's lined up now and I'm looking in better condition. Now comes a big test. What am I going to do? If I don't put my weight on the leg, I'll never know, I'll never get off. Got to give you to go. I'm sitting here in the snow, wondering what the hell I'm going to do. I can't stand up and walk. I've tried crawling. I've got a whistle. I start to blow my whistle in case there's anybody just the other side of the rib. I'm sitting there, thinking what else can I do to attract attention? I, I've got nothing else. I've let them down. I've let my mates down and uh, they're probably going to die. They have now been exposed on a barren mountainside for hours. And even though the Arctic nights are very short, as the sun gets lower, it just gets colder and colder. It's getting close to sort of 9, 10 o'clock, 10.30 time, where I'm starting to realise that at that time of the day, it'll be very unlikely that a rescue party will come to us. And as a result, it, it, it's starting to hit home that we could be out in a very exposed area for a second night. Nigel? Steve was a hero of the day for raising the alarm and getting the helicopter to us. At 19,500 feet, this is still the highest helicopter rescue on record in North America. And it was only attempted because of Nigel's mayday call the previous night. But it's not looking good for Steve. Night is beginning to fall, and in these temperatures, Steve knows he'll be lucky to survive the hours ahead. I've got to look after myself for the night now. I've got to think about shelter, about keeping myself warm. What if the wind comes down the mountain? I untie my ice axe from my leg and I etch out a shallow hollow and build up a small wall. It's enough to keep any wind off. I need to make sure that I stay awake when it's dark. If I don't stay awake, I die.
This is it. The sun's gone down. If I think about four hours in the dark, temperatures down to minus 50 centigrade, and surviving it, it's a long, long way to go. Steve's body is succumbing to the cold. He tries desperately to stay alive. I'm thinking about my family back home in England. That's keeping me going. I want to see my family. I want to go home to them. I've got to stay awake. I'm messing with my leg. I'm putting my goggles over my eyes so my eyes don't freeze. Even tapping my leg to stimulate some pain so that it keeps me awake. Climber Steve Ball has had an horrific fall on Mount McKinley. He's been stranded for 15 hours with terrible injuries in unbelievable cold. His fellow climbers, Anthony and Nigel, have been rescued. All he can do now is hope someone finds him before he dies. Steve! His friends have no idea that Steve is still lost on the mountain. Somebody came into my room in the hospital to ask me what Steve was wearing. It's only then I actually realised that Steve wasn't in a place of safety. He'd been there for up to 12 hours out, exposed on the mountainside, and nobody knew where he was. Climbers have now been alerted and are out searching for Steve, but they have no idea where to look for him and have little hope of finding him alive. It is rare for the human body to survive overnight temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees. I can't feel my feet anymore. My nose is cold. I don't want to take my fingers out of my pockets. I just want to stay huddled up. I haven't got a lot left. I'm starting to lose it. Steve's lost all hope of being saved. He hasn't made it to the path. All he can do is wait for death. hearing voices, and I don't know who it is. I think I'm dreaming. But it's not a dream. These voices are real. Tom, on the radio, quick. I know these voices, and I know I'm being rescued. I know I can't be dreaming it because I'm feeling the pain and you don't feel pain when you're dreaming. I'm awake. They tell me they're climbers and they found me and they're surprised that I'm still alive. Alive, and I'm going to stay alive. I want to go home. After two weeks in Alaska in intensive care, Steve was allowed to travel back to the UK. He spent a further six months in hospital and another two years in rehabilitation. My frostbite injuries resulted in amputations of all the fingers and thumb on my right hand, uh, my left hand, mid-palm. The left leg has gone below the knee and my right foot has gone mid-foot. And of course, a little bit of nose. 
Anthony and Nigel both suffered from severe frostbite. Anthony lost two fingers. Nigel lost all his fingers and all of his toes, as well as needing skin grafts to reconstruct his cheek and nose. I've managed to travel the world numerous times since all this happened, and going to the Arctic, the Himalayas and climb. A little slower. Steve's asked me, uh, as, as he would, uh, whether we, we could go back and do it again, and I'd like to think that we will get back and get another expedition planned, possibly all three of us together, uh, and do something. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. I'm disabled now, but I'm out foul running, out walking, I go rock climbing, I go mountaineering, uh, snowboarding, skiing, canoeing. I still go back to the mountains, I still climb, and I still get the same pleasure and enjoyment from the mountains. So, no, it's not worth losing life and limb. But you can't stop going. <laughs> I'm hooked. <laughs>